Hi, and good evening from St. Clair Monastery in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, I'm Dawn Eden Goldstein. I'm here uh, just uh, visiting the monastery, staying here. Uh, the, the poor Claires here have been uh, very kind in agreeing uh, to host me. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm here in New Orleans doing research on a Jesuit who lived and worked here named Father Louis J. Toomey, who's going to be uh, the subject of my next biography. Uh, but today I'm really uh, delighted to be answering your questions about Father Ed. Well, let me do the uh, QVC thing and show the book Father Ed, um, soon to be available in paperback. Um, so I, I was so happy to get your questions. They're terrific questions. They are all really good questions, and I especially love them because they show that you really read the book and that you read it with interest. So thank you. That's a, that's an an honor. Um, so let me get to the answers, or rather the questions and then the answers. Uh, so the first question is, did Dowling ever identify a catalyst that put the idea of becoming a Jesuit into his mind? If not, do you think that it was Mullaney, Leo Mullaney, SJ, who initially inspired him? First of all, thank you for asking me about Leo Mullaney, SJ. Nobody has asked me about him since I wrote this book, uh, since it came out more than a year ago, not one person has even mentioned to me Leo Mullaney, SJ, and I so loved learning about him. He was just this fascinating character. I found like all these different stories about him, things I wanted to publish about him that I, uh, that I couldn't just because there wasn't space. I think I actually had more material on him that my editor may have cut out. I felt like he deserved his own, his own book. Um, the thing that I found about Father Mullaney is that number one, I, I found uh, a relative of his, like a, a great, a great nephew, I think, or a great niece, who had posted about him on Ancestry.com, and there are all these photos of him from when he was young, like a young Jesuit, um, and earlier in childhood, where he's just smiling and grinning. And then, he, in most of the photos of him after his ordination, or many of them anyway, except maybe the official ones from when he was teaching and his photos in yearbook, many of the photos, he's also smiling. Um, and there's this one great photo of him where he's in his final illness. People usually don't look great when they're in their final illness. Uh, and, he, and he was young when he died too, he was just 55. Um, but this is apparently like during the last months or weeks of his life, he's lying in a hospital bed being visited and he's got this big smile. Um, and uh, it just seems like everybody liked him. Um, that was the consensus, that he was a great humorist, uh, and, uh, and people were just really fond of him. Um, uh, there's a, an obituary of his that says that filling out a questionnaire seeking biographical data in 1939, Father Mullaney listed his hobby as, quote, forgetting. Um, so let me see if I can find this other thing. Oh yeah, so um, someone, a, a woman who, who knew him um, and who um, I guess may, might have been a colleague of his when he was teaching at Creighton University said of the, the then father Leo Mullaney um, said many tend to regard quote unquote greatness in a sense of power, wealth, or prestige, Father Mullaney possessed something far nobler and more lasting, his natural gift of making others happy, his ability to make you laugh and forget the troubled world around you. So thank you for asking about Father Mullaney. Now back, back to the question, um, I, do I think it was Mullaney who inspired him initially? Um, to become a Jesuit, to, who inspired Dowling to become a Jesuit. Um, definitely the idea had been 
in Edward Dowling's mind a while before he met Mulaney. But yeah, I think Mulaney kind of took him over the edge, really made him think seriously that he himself could be a Jesuit. Because um, Dowling had this very elevated idea of Jesuits, priests in general, but especially Jesuits as just being super holy people above the, the normal race of mortal men. And um, Mulaney, he was definitely someone who was serious about holiness, but he also was fun and jovial and, and um, creative. And so that kind of made the idea of being a Jesuit seem more real to, to, uh, to uh, um, Edward Dowling. I, I think that um, was made him feel, feel like, gosh, maybe I can do this. Maybe God is calling me to this. Uh, so the second question, did Father Ed ever express frustration at Bill W's sort of on and now off attitude about Catholicism? Um, so, no, not exactly. I, I don't think Father Ed exactly um, expressed frustration, but he did make that one comment that I mentioned uh, somewhere. He was writing to his friend Greta Palmer, and he says like something like, you know, yeah, Bill's talking up a storm about being interested in Catholicism, but I think he's still in the horse latitude, and I, like pretty much everybody else, except maybe a budding meteorologist, had to look up what is the horse latitude. It just means lukewarm. You know, it's that part of the world that is, that is lukewarm or just doesn't really change in temperature much and is mild. So... So yeah, I mean, privately, Father Red said, yeah, I know Bill is really lukewarm about this. I wouldn't quite call that frustration. He didn't seem angry about it. He just was kind of easygoing about it. Um, but certainly, uh, Father Red, as I mentioned, um, was writing to Sister Ignatia privately and saying, you know, pray, basically, you know, encouraging Sister Ignatia to pray for Bill's conversion. I'm not sure if he even had to encourage her to pray, but I mean, he was sort of, you know, feeding her information about like, oh, I think Bill's close, you know. Um, so, um, you know, definitely, although I wouldn't say Father Ed was frustrated about the situation, he was hoping that Bill would become Catholic. Um, so uh, the question is, you wrote that Wilson saw Father Ed as a father figure. In your opinion, did Dowling see Wilson as a son or mentee? Um, I think Father Ed primarily saw Bill as a friend, but he also realized that Bill saw him, Father Ed, as someone with a bit of mystique as a Jesuit priest, and I, I think he was also aware that Bill was really looking to him for guidance. So I think that Father Ed, um, knowing how serious and sacred is the relationship between a spiritual director and a directee, I think Father Ed did see Bill as a directee. And he, I would just say that Oh, there's my phone. Let me make sure that it's not making noises. Um, yeah, I would just uh, say that um, Father Ed honored the um, sacred space that's kind of between a director and a directee. Um, and, you know, I think he was careful in his relationship with Bill to, um, to recognize that Bill took the things he said very seriously. So I think he would measure his words a bit to ensure that he wasn't trying to force Bill into anything or, because, you know, if someone, if you're someone to whom people are like, look up to you, then your words have a lot of power for that person. And so, you know, if you respect that person, you want to make sure 
that you're not even appearing to pressure that person. So I think that was, pardon the outside noise, uh, I think that was part of the um, relationship, the way that um, Father Ed saw his relationship with Bill, where he, um, he, he, he was sensitive to not in any way trying to, um, or even appearing to use his authority to try to pressure or force Bill into anything. Um, so then um, the question is, what was his biggest struggle? How do you think his personal struggles changed his belief and way of thinking? Well, I kind of allude to loneliness being a struggle for Father Ed in the book, and I came to believe that loneliness was his cross. Um, the advice that he gave to young Ronnie Creighton Job, who became Father Ronald Creighton Job, um, the advice he gave, or just the wisdom he gave about the difference between uh, being um, being alone and being lonely. There was something he said, and I'd have to um, double check it, but um, it, it would take me a moment to look to look it up. It's in it's in one of the one of the later um, chapters. I could probably find it if I looked up if I looked up. Um, Creighton Job, let me see. Maybe I, I should look it up. Um, might be on, oh, it might be between pages 241 and 246. Let's see. Um, let's see, where does he talk about it? Um, he talks about, oh, here it is. Um, here, here he is, um, solitude and isolation. This is on page 243. Um, Father Ed um, distinguished between solitude and isolation. Um, solitude, I was talking to Father Creighton Job about this, and he basically agreed that, um, that Father Ed was kind of, in some way, drawing upon the Catholic understanding of the word monk coming from monos, which technically means alone, but for the monk, monos as the root of monk means being alone with God. Um, so the impression I got from Father Creighton Job was that Father Ed recognized that in his solitude, interiorly, he was alone with God. And he tried to foster that rather than fostering, rather than feeding the, you know, the sense of isolation. But but having said that, um, it does seem that um, in order to fight off feelings of isolation, Father Ed sought fellowship with people with problems, and he ultimately really found this fellowship as a kind of an honorary member of AA, even though he couldn't be a real me member because he was, in his words, underprivileged, uh, not being a, an alcoholic himself. Um, so um, how did, the question is, how did Father Edward relate to or touch people in Alcoholics Anonymous, even though he was never an alcoholic? It's a good question. Um, I think, um, you know, we kind of have to take him at his word when he says that, and he said this on the last night of his life, he was explaining that um, he really liked that AAs were honest with themselves and with God, and that they spoke about God openly and not as though the word were something, you know, embarrassing, like the word legs in the Victorian age. Um, so, so yeah, I think Father Ed um, really admired that people in AA would openly talk about their weaknesses, their vulnerabilities, and their absolute dependence upon God, you know, at every moment of the day, you know, because that's the first step. We admitted we were powerless, and then 
you know, the, um, and then the um, second step, I believe, is keen to believe. I have to check the 12 steps at the end of this uh, book. Um, you can see me kind of reflexively doing this. That's because when I give talks, I have to check to make sure I get them correct. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And then the third step, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. That's on page um, 313. Um, anyway, um, anyway, so yeah, I, I, I think he really admired their AA's openness about their dependence upon God because he was every day conscious of his dependence in many different ways, even just physically dependent on other people to help him cross the street because of his disability and dependent on other people to groom him. Uh, so, uh, you know, how much more dependent upon God for sustaining him every day of his life and God for providing him with friends who, who cared for him and supported him. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, that's, those are among the reasons why he, he greatly admired people in, in AA. He was kind of in awe of them, and that's why he felt honored being able to spend time with them. Um, wow, well, I think that's the last of the questions. So uh, again, thank you so much um, for these great questions. And uh, I, uh, I, gather, I gather from reading your questions that you enjoyed reading uh, the book, and I, I certainly hope you did, and it makes me very happy if you did. So God bless you.